Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the fourth event in the Summer Carnival Programme. As fate would have it, the UK traffic control systems went down yesterday, and some of the participants in today's panel discussion are still stuck in airports, or they're en route, or they're on the Alila Laguna after nearly two days of travel. There's some consolation in the fact that these talks are recorded and will be uploaded to the Biennale website in a couple of weeks for a much wider audience, but my heart goes out to those who are stranded in London, Manchester, and elsewhere. I'm not chairing or moderating this panel, so I won't be making the introductions, but I would like to welcome the African Architectural and Urban History Network to the carnival program at La Biennale di Venezia. The network was actually formed during COVID, if I remember correctly, and its meetings have been held almost entirely online. It's wonderful to be all here, or almost all here in person for the first time, even though the network founding members have known each other for decades. It's ironic that having survived a worldwide two-year lockdown, our first in-person meeting has been thwarted by air traffic control, but there we have it two ends of the vast technological spectrum, software that connects us, and software that divides. Almost 300 years ago, Alexander Pope wrote that the proper study of mankind is man. I can't claim to know or understand Pope's writings in anything other than an anecdotal sense, but I like to think that his use of the word man is misplaced rather than intentional, although I suspect that's being overly generous. I mention the phrase because it's become clear to me over the past three decades that the proper study of self is history. I'm not a historian, and although I generally dislike the gatekeeping that characterizes so many professions, think of the number of times you've heard the phrase, I'm not an architect, but, or I'm not a philosopher, but. But in this case, it's important to acknowledge the distinction between historians who work within hist Western historical traditions and those who exist and thrive outside of it. Griots, oral historians, spoken word poets, figures who carry other kinds of knowledge are vital links in the ever-expanding gaps between tradition, modernity, and the future. Their work reveals things that are written or recorded histories often miss, mood, atmosphere, community, for example. I often think of architecture, archaeology, and history as co a codependent triangle, supporting limbs of a complex structure that involves earth, time, resources, presence, recording successes and failures equally. There is a beautiful phrase in archeology span which sustained my student inquiries into the relationship between race, identity, and architecture. It's called the argument from silence, which in archeological terms means that if you dig somewhere and don't find anything, it does not mean that nothing happened. Contrary to the phrase, the silence is full of sound and meaning, if you know where to look. So welcome, everybody. Thank you, panel. Hello. Right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I think we've already, we already know we've had a situations well beyond our control. Um, using a Nigerian phrase, condition they make crayfish bend. But we are where we are, and it's great to have you in the audience and those who will be listening to us later on. Um, my role at this first part of the session is really just to be the compere. So I'm not going to take a lot of time, but I'm going to lay out the session, so to speak. We have now three speakers, um, the first of whom, Professor Ikemi Okoye, will be talking to us about Afrahun. And then we have the two speakers, Kukua Manfu, and also Neil Shashore, both of whom will be setting out their positions. Um, I would um, um, urge you to listen to what's being said. And I think despite it being a smaller session, this gives us more time and those speakers who you're going to listen, time to really set out their positions and to give you the introductions that you need for this session. So without further ado, Professor Ikem Okoye, I'm handing over to you. Hello, uh, everyone. Um, 
Bienvenuti a questa sessione. Mi chiamo Ikem Okoye. And that's it for my Italian. My name is Ikem Okoye, and I am tasked merely to make a few introductory comments about the purpose of our gathering. Um, and you have a number of images up here that you can for now regard as a kind of eye candy, quite honestly. Events such as the Venice Architecture Biennale take a measure of where architecture, its productional culture, and its dialogues, discourses, and debates, and controversies, if even, all are in the period of, period of the exhibition staging. It is usually addressing the contemporary architecture of its generation. This Biennale that we are privileged to visit is perhaps atypical in the degree to which contemporary Africa as a site and as a site for thinking the future is seriously considered alongside the interventions of the producers of buildings in the same often neglected space of Africa and the African diasporas, architects, designers, critics, and their occupancies of a deserving place in the global assembly. It is also wonderful that in this context, Dialogues about architectural pedagogy, both across the world and within the sub-region of Africa, has a platform, a long-addressed concern of many of us here gathered today, if it has been less so for the architectural profession at large. In this context, we can also say that in relation to architectural pedagogy, a subject that certainly Leslie Loco, Ola Oduku, and Mark Oweni, who, who is um, on his way here, have sometimes made subjects of their critiques or scholarship, the possibility of an African contribution to the conversation is largely overlooked, and when it had not been, there may have been an extractive politics lurking in its shadows. I mean that in some ways, the interest in African architecture in global North context has often been a mere reinforcement of something like a neoliberal economics. This may be related in some ways to the fact that we can count, that what we can count as architecture in Africa, as well as architecture historical knowledge located in African pasts, is insuffi insufficiently researched, understood, circulated in the academy. Although the academy is not and should not be subject to practice or to the profession, the possibility of African architecture and urbanism and their landscapes and geographies, especially acute when the objects are of non-modern African worlds, has been a kind of Achilles heel of the academic disciplines. History, theory and criticism of architecture, geography, or spatial analysis. Engaging African possibilities has been no less attended to in critical architectural practice and in curation and exhibition, themselves also practices, of course. It is very weird, in other words, how much difficulty there has been with producing global relevance of Africa, let alone working on its histories, cartographies, geographies that can account for African perspectives even attempts to impose a universalizing and non-discriminatory chronological structure over world architecture, for example, typically struggles with recognizing the architectural in Africa as well as how or where to fit it into the narrative. If I speak to the history of architecture, for instance, most historical attempts spend a few pages, quite late in its narrative, if we are speaking of books, to engage with, say, Sudanese architecture, as it was once called, in the West African Sahel, more often than not focused on, say, the Dogon peoples of Mali, after which never to revisit Africa again until the European colonial modernism or the modernisms of post-colonial Africa often still European designs built by European contractors, even if in the service of post-colonies. These present a conundrum for architectural historians whose focus can precisely be the space of something like a non-architecture of which at least these four images might be pointing to. 
even though, in truth, architectural thinking has existed in Africa, of course, our disciplines cannot lay claim to its full recognition. The honor, if we want to give it that label, must, where modern and contemporary architecture is not the subject, be granted to other, if equally problematic, colonially constituted disciplines, such as anthropology and ethnography. It was in this universe, in the work of everyone from Frobenius and Talbot to Fernandez, that an outsider interest in African buildings and spaces was sustained in the 20th century, and that some early Africanist architectural historians, such as Labelle Prusin or Kay Anderson, came to cut their symbolic space-infused, space-organizational and space-mentality-focused teeth. Even where, as Prusin also recognized, buildings as such might not be involved, she, like many others, nevertheless ultimately came to their most scholarly works by focusing on sub-Saharan Islamic architecture, in part resorting to the colonial archive, whether European or European acquisitions of Arabic manuscripts or dispersals of local archives of Arab script transcribed local African language, oral histories and performance traditions and dramaturgies as say in work on Hausa or Swahili. These are productive approaches deployed by many of us here gathered today, including in Ijo language work about nomad fisher folk in Africa's Venice or early modern architecture in Port Harcourt as Warebi Brisibe and Ramota Obaga Stevens are doing. And I just spoke to them there at the airport and will be here later, they were delayed. Equally, one could point to Chui language work by Victoria Okoye, no relative, whose transnational geographies had recently focused on Accra but in the archive, and that's remembered in spoken narratives about the past, third person I mentioned, and they have not been able to get here. So historical knowledge about African architecture and urbanism has always existed from ancient times, as these works suggest, and is distributed in all kinds of traditions of memory and remembering. In most places, this has been supplemented by knowledge production deploying the post-enlightenment disciplines already mentioned, but also includes archaeology, geology, climatology and climate st studies, art history, including photography, film studies, and these days digital-based um, knowledge production as well, and text-based critical history as additional grounds on which certain kinds of knowledge about Africa has been built. But these newer epistemologies also operate erasures that are now widely distributed in fact and dominant in the academy as representing what it is we know now about Africa's past and as this exhibition shows what the West knows about Africa's present. Worse may be that the past relevance to the present inflicts a heavy burden on imaginations of the future. I'm sure we'll get to this issue over our two meetings. For now, I will refer instead to what is perhaps amazing still, and at the core of the motivation, as I understand it anyway, for the founding of Afroun, the network around which we are gathered uh, in its um, public uh, launching today. The difficulty we have had even in these kinds of conversations among a broad spectrum that we represent. Most of us work in isolation, by which I mean disconnected from the community of shared interests that could support our ability to effectively insert Africa's relevance to the discursive contexts of contemporary architecture and urbanism. Whether we operate in the academy, in institutions like museums, or in professional practices, such as, say, in urban design firms in somewhere like the UK, and I just ran into someone exactly in that position uh, a couple of days ago who works for Herzog and Dumeren, 
and was really excited to even hear that this kind of organization was being put together and is very um, interested in finding out some more. For some of us, the negative deficits borne by our students can become quite challenging and unbearable in relation to these lacks. So the African Architectural, Architectural and Urban History Network organized, as far as I am aware, in December 2020 or possibly earlier, sometimes uh, in separate dialogues between Olau Duku, Murray Fraser, Leslie Loco, Namdi L.A. from the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, who's not here, and yours truly, is, was set up, therefore, as a means to tackle these difficulties, as a kind of forum through which to repair these situations. Ultimately, it will hope to be a much enlarged platform admitting Africans and Africans in the diaspora across which certain kinds of exchanges achieve a kind of density, although there's an ambition to imagine or enable much more too. I didn't attend the last meeting, and some of what I need to say I totally ignorant about, but I, I, I'm making these comments based on several other encounters that we've all had together. So the session today invited a small number of uh, hopefully uh, new members of this group, and it will continue to grow by such additions and introductions. Even presently, there are a good number of people not yet asked, and the point of this was to be quite careful in making such voices of new members uh, are fully heard and considered in the process of becoming a part of the loosely affiliated group. This is a key and critical point, even though we also recognize that the process itself may, be, may by this be forming a consensus, uh, but we are committed to new members, is that even the correct word for it, being put in position always to, to fully transform our dialogues, even when these have been had in the past. Um, I don't know if anyone's going to do the introductions of Kukua and Neil before they get to speak, um, but with that, I come to my, to my end. Oh, thank you very much, Ikem. I think you were put on stage first, and you've done an incredibly good job of introducing us to the session. Um, and yes, I think just adding on to that as, I guess, one of the founder group members of Afrahun. The whole idea was also to, Im to embed the group with new voices, younger voices, and emerging voices. And our pleasure at this session is to actually hear these emerging voices and indeed set out their stall. I think what's important about it is, as Ikem has pointed out, there are challenges, there are always challenges around historiography, and architecture always for some reason seems to be the, let's say, slightly poorer sister, and indeed, we've been encroached, if you like, by other uh, disciplines. But what's really interesting now is that I think we have got to a stage, and Afrahun hopefully is part of that, where we can start to hear the voices and hear our, vo hear our voices in relationship to these other parts of, um, I would say, um, um, historiography, history, archaeology, ethnography, even music. Uh, well, not just even music, but the various other disciplines which in some ways inform how we use space. And in some ways, architecture itself may be, as a, as, a, as a discipline or as we see it, itself needs to be challenged when we look at it within an African frame. As I said, though, my, my job here is really to chair. So what I'm going to do now is to hand over to Kukua and then Neil who are both, we would say, young and emerging academics of the future generation, for them to tell us both what they've been doing and what their view is, because that was, that was their brief. Tell us what you think, and they've got the stage now. I should give a minor introduction to both, I guess. Um, Kukua is now a full lecturer at Michigan Uni 
Michigan University or Michigan State, which University of Michigan, uh, and she's just flown in, so welcome. Hope there's not too much jet lag. Whereas um, Dr. Neil Shashore is the head, is that the correct word, or executive director? Head of the school, the, the, the London School of Architecture, a very interesting institution, but I know he'll be talking not just about that, but also about his work as well. So could you please welcome both of them to, uh, to discuss with us? But first of all, we'll be listening to Kukua. I will move. I think I'll just sit here, as everyone has. Um, thanks, um, Ola and Kim. Yeah, that's my slide. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I just started. My, my first class was yesterday. Today's 29th. Yesterday, 28th, um, at the University of Michigan. So I flew here after my first class. I'm not. I haven't slept in a while, so bear with me. Um, so I'm gonna speak today about uh, an archives digitization project that I recently completed. Um, it's called the Accra Archive. Um, it was funded by the British Library. Um, but first, some background. And as you see on the images below, with the first one, um, is the state of the archive when I first encountered it. So I took that photograph in 2015 in Accra, Ghana, while doing field research for my MSc in African Studies. Um, prior to finding this space and taking this photo, I had been traveling around major cities in Ghana, trying to locate and speak to the oldest building design professionals, think architects, draftsmen, contractors, that I could find. Um, because in much of the literature about histories of architecture and the building profession in Ghana and Africa more broadly, there was not much written about indigenous building designers and building design professionals, particularly those who practice in what is called pre-colonial, um, a term I don't really like, but we'll use it for convenience here, and early colonial Gold Coast, um, as Ghana was known. Um, yet I was certain that there had to be architects and other building design professionals because there were buildings from that time period all over the country, like the building that my great granddad built, um, or both on my father's side and my mother's side, some of which had the years written um, on the capstones in the buildings. So it was in looking to solve this meeting um, that brought me to the, solve this mystery that led to a meeting that brought me into this space. Um, and it doesn't, I don't think it fully captures how old, dusty, and yet somehow also moldy and pest infested the room was on the shores of the Atlantic Ocean in Jamestown, Accra. So it turned out to be an amazing resource because as I inadvisedly touched and handled these materials with my bare hands, I realized that they were building permit applications submitted to the authority that was in charge of the capital city under colonial rule um, called the Accra Town Council. So this was before Accra was the city. Um, and it contained architectural drawings from as early as the 1900s. And just instantly, I saw that these were records of African inhabitants of Accra attempting to make spaces for themselves in the city under this new colonial dispensation that was very foreign to them. And as you see, several of the documents were in bad states, and some were literally crumbling in my hands as I handled them. Um, and as the time I had for my field research um, ended and I had to leave, um, I had this really sad, depressing realization that I might be the last person to ever handle or use these materials. And after me, no other person trying to explore this stuff from some other, maybe better angle will be able to access it. Um, so that's when I decided I needed to do something about it. Um, and to skip to the good part, eventually I was awarded a grant from the British Library um, and led a project to digitize this archive. And I did this alongside my PhD, which in hindsight was too much stress and I wouldn't repeat. Um, but the end result is beautiful. It's the Accra Archive and it's a digital repository of records, architectural drawings, these building permit applications, images, and even artifacts from Ghana. 
and even artifacts, because once I started doing this project and we'll post about it online, I had people reaching out and saying, hey, like, my grandfather has this thing. Do you want it? Do you want to digitize it for your project? Um, people reaching out and telling me stories that they remembered from some of the images I shared online. Um, but now this is a colonial archive. It's an archive of the British administration. As Prof. Okuri has mentioned, a lot of the sources are created under colonial dispensation. And they are attempts to discipline the way people lived and built, and the way they even honored their, uh, their debt. Um, so just as an aside, in Accra, um, the institution of cemeteries um, by the British colonial government was brought under the guise of sanitation and health laws. Um, but there's been recent studies that it was actually the way to for the British colonial government to get land in the city. Because in Ghana, unlike other colonial, um, um, colonial occupied territories in Africa, they were not just able to seize land because there was an established sort of elite and land owning elite um, who had to be forced off their land in other, way, uh, other ways. So how people would bury their dead before colonization was to bury them in their homes. So you lived with your ancestors, they will be buried in the floors of the bedrooms in your house. And my great grandfather's house has people buried in the floors of the room. Um, so the British Institutes of the Law, that you could no longer bury people at home because it was unsanitary, it was uncivilized, and you had to use cemeteries. Um, so what happened was that by forcing people to take their dead from the homes, people lost their sort of ancestral and cultural ties to the property in their home and it was easier for them to move because they would never move from a home that held the body of the ancestor. Just on the side of like this colonial disciplining of space. Um, but it doesn't mean that this archive has to be read or used in the way it was intended or created. And as many countless others have argued about archives and reading colonial archives, you can read an archive across or along its grain. You can approach it as a sort of ethnographic project thinking of the people and the activities around the archive, or you can just accept it as a piece of fiction, a wonderful piece of fiction, and go along with that, with that fiction. So with these approaches in mind, um, next slide. So with these approaches with mind, in mind, and yet with an expansive yet critical view of what counts as a source in historical research, I took this newly digitized archive as a window, but also a path to stray from, and a series of blurred lines, a lot of fictions. Um, so the primary empirical material is now um, a key source for my next major research project, um, which is titled Formalization and Unformalization, not in, unformalization, which I'll explain a, a little later. Um, so a lot of prevailing approaches to studying architecture and urbanism in what is broadly termed as a global south have revolved around dichotomies of formality and informality, with buildings either analyzed or studied as formal, built by licensed architects, regulated by the state or institutions of authority, or as informal, typically haphazard, aberrant structures of poverty and state failure, such as the slums, kiosks, and shacks that you will hear about. And given this, a staggering proportion of the African continent's built environment is categorized as informal. But yet, there's a vast assortment of buildings that are created outside the realms of professionalized government-regulated architecture and architects, yet are very carefully constructed, painstakingly designed, and capital-intensive. Example on this slide is, um, an office, a Brandon office in Accra, which was designed by the owner of the office who stuck half of a VW Beetle on it because he could and he wanted to. Um, so given examples like this, which include huge shopping malls um, in major cities across the country and an entire estate in Zimbabwe, for instance, this formal informal dichotomy does not sufficiently capture the complexities of the urban context in Africa, and indeed much of the world, if we think about it. Um, therefore, I'm proposing a, a change in how we theorize and categorize formality and informality. And this is where my next project comes in. I'm studying 
dual processes of formalization and what I call the unformalization of architecture by state and institutional authorities in West Africa. I start by systematically examining the roots of the diminution and destruction of African architectural knowledge and practice by European colonial governments. I use archives such as the one that I've newly digitized, alongside sources like oral histories, remnants of historical buildings, and stories of building, including myths, legends, and rumors, and try to construct how people used to build and what they thought about building and what their relation was with building and architecture in their communities. So that European colonial governments really largely succeeded in formalizing the who, the what, and the how of building in West Africa through professional licensing, architectural education, and building regulation, among others. And I show through this project that this formalization went hand in hand with a concurrent process of diminishing, excluding, and destroying the built environmental knowledge activities and objects of the colonized, the less powerful actors. And this is what I call unformalization. Because informal, informality, the informal, is conceptualized as sort of a byproduct, almost benign, almost accidental, something that just happens to be. But unformalization is deliberate. It's a process of destruction, a process of exclusion. And through unformalization, colonial governments delegitimized the long-established ways that Africans had been building and eradicated a whole lot of knowledge, skills, and forms that were uniquely suited to African climatic and cultural contexts. And a lot of these have disappeared, and some are just holding on. Um, in January, I'm going to be going to the Volta region to record one of the last master builders of a type of construction called Atakpame, which is a type of waterland dob construction. And it was just so difficult to find this person in light. I just hope he's still alive by the time I get there. Um, so the building permit applications that I've shown you show a lot of things. And they show how the colonial state imposed its vision of architecture on Goku's residents. For instance, forcing them to build with imported cement rather than local materials, to whitewash walls, to use aluminum rather than clay or thatch for roofs. And at the same time, it shows that this was not just a cultural domination project, but also economic. Because once I chart um, in the annual colonial records, the rules around stopping building in earth and clay and having to build in concrete, I see imports steadily increasing in ordinary Portland cement, which was produced in England, and people having to use to build. So there was also an economic aspect of this. And if anyone knows Accra, Ghana, much of West Africa, this dependent on cement is this dependence on cement is still there, and it's really hard to get people away from it, even when there are better materials available. Um, so I'll just end here, because this is the time I have, and I look forward to discussing further. Thank you. Well, I know it's really working. Thank you so much. Um, I think maybe at the end of this, we might be able to have one or two questions, but before we get to there, um, I very much welcome Neil to the stage or to discuss. We need to move your slides. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Neil, and as Ola said in her introduction, uh, I uh, am head of school at uh, an institution called the London School of Architecture, obviously based in London, um, which was set up. 10 years ago by my predecessor who was the founder as a, uh, essentially as a, a new school for a new century. And any new school thinking about a new century um, for obvious reasons, uh, I think must engage not only with what is happening in London, but what is happening uh, elsewhere around the world and in particular with, with I think, with the continent of Africa. Um, I think what I'd probably start off by saying is, is I, I think why I'm here, um, and I'm you know, very pleased and very reassured to hear a uh, uh, discussion about the diaspora. Um, I'm of the diaspora, I'm, I'm of mixed heritage, uh, half Nigerian, my father was born in Lagos, uh, and my mother is a Ugandan Asian born in Kampala. And 
uh, I, I think I mention that because um, n not only do I hope Afrohoon might uh, engage with the diaspora, we don't want any uh, sense of intellectual oimbo, but, um, but also um, I think to tackle sometimes the very difficult and sometimes the very painful um, uh, stories of migration uh, and diaspora, in particular in relation to architecture, space and the built environment. I'll talk more about that uh, uh, later on. Um, and I think that I am probably coming at this, coming at Afrohoon, coming to Afrohoon, um, from three perspectives. One, broadly institutional, uh, how do you form institutions and how do you sustain them? For some reason, I find that interesting. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, pedagogical, um, you know, we're at a moment, certainly within the UK context, of, of I think, profound opportunity for reform in not just architectural, but built environment education if we're going to meet the challenge of um, climate emergency, but also uh, increasingly acute social inequity. And I think there's much to learn, as, as we've just been hearing. Um, uh, and then, as a historian, uh, I'm not an architect, but uh, uh, I'm an architectural historian who, who, who happens to be running an architecture school. What, what narratives might we, might we tell? Um, so I was just, I'll just talk very briefly to these, to these images, which pr pr probably kind of help to explain my scholarly interest in, 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 in some of this. So on the left uh, are two um, panels from the Dominion screen uh, in the Florence Hall at 66 Portland Place, which is the headquarters of the Royal Institute of British Architects, which was, of course, the preeminent uh, imperial uh, association of professional uh, architects uh, in the late 19th uh, and into the middle of the 20th century. And what you're looking at um, are essentially it's a it's a it's a grid um, designed by a sculptor called Dennis Cheney Dunlop, um, showing um, the people, uh, industries, flora and fauna uh, of the dominions, i.e. the white settler dominions and India. And this already indicates, I suppose, the ways in which the architectural profession uh, sought to hang on the coattails of a particular kind of industrial strategy in the 1920s and 30s, which was to promote intra-imperial trade amongst the white settler dominions much more than the uh, uh, so-called dependent colonies. And I'm just showing you two panels from the um, South Africa column, uh, the first of which uh, depicts um, a, a generic uh, um, uh, tribeswoman um, pounding grain, we can assume, and then, and then there's a young boy with a, with a cock pecking at his plate in front, of, in front of some huts. And then at the bottom, this uh, rather um, uh, elusive scene certainly took me a while for the penny to drop. Um, which shows Table Mountain in the, in the background uh, and a mining operation in the foreground. This is most likely a uh, big hole, um, i.e. the center of Cecil Rhodes's De Beers mining operation. So it's quite interesting, why would you, why would you include these um, depictions in, in an architectural professional institute? Um, and, and, and more interestingly, um, uh, on the Canadian um, column is a depiction of a, of a, a white mustachioed uh, lumberjack hacking down a pine tree. You can tell it's a pine tree because of the fronds in the foreground of the panel. Uh, and um, that indicates the fact that uh, the panel itself is, is, is sculpted, is carved from Quebec pine. Um, and uh, the specification for 66 Portland Place um, emphasized the use of empire timber. And I have a particular interest in empire timber and the ways in which architects as specifiers um, drew on these international and imperial networks of supply and how we can understand those uh, better, in particular in, in, as it were, the modern world uh, in the 20th century. 
To the right uh, is um, a carved uh, uh, door, um, two leaves of, of, of a doorway uh, by Olowe Ovishe. Uh, and these are at the British Museum. And these were displayed, they were probably carved in the early 1920s, uh, uh, and this was displayed at the British Empire Exhibition at Wembley in 1924. Actually, as part of a display of West African uh, timber. So again, part of this wider narrative of empire timber. Um, and I've included this, um, I suppose, partly to, uh, uh, as a kind of entry point to discuss the British Empire Exhibition at Wembley, which has been a long-standing research interest of mine, Empire Exhibition at Wembley uh, ran between 1924 and 1926, and so next year is the centenary uh, of that exhibition. And I've been trying for a couple of years to figure out what might be an appropriate way of marking that centenary, and slightly trepidatious that um, otherwise, if, if, if I don't do anything, um, uh, what kind of loons might get hold of the, the narrative um, in, our, in our particular political moment in the UK. Um, and the Empire Exhibition, of course, was vast. 17 million people visited um, just in the first year. It opened on St. George's Day, of course, uh, uh, in 1924, um, and uh, included a number of pavilions, um, not just of the white settler dominions, but also of, uh, of, of colonies and protectorates. Um, and uh, what I've been trying to do is figure out how to generate a more inclusive and critical narrative of the Empire Exhibition. So we've just received some funding from the um, British Council, some scoping funding, um, in particular to engage with uh, uh, scholars, curators, craftsmen, um, designers uh, uh, of the diaspora, not just in, uh, in Africa, but, but in fact across all the former territories of the British Empire, to recover or to engage with um, histories, memories, traces, narratives of the Empire Exhibition outside of London and outside of the UK. Because, the, you know, the tendency is to tell stories of international expositions of this kind through a primarily Eurocentric lens. Um, the other... I uh, don't know what I've done with the clicker. Sorry, oh, there it is. If I could move on, please, Ola, to the next slide. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about, about the Empire Exhibition later on. But, but another bit of work w w which um, is, I think, happening at a, a smaller scale uh, is uh, around uh, Herbert Macaulay, uh, the, one of the great heroes of uh, Nigerian nationalism. Um, and uh, I've been thinking a little bit about Macaulay and about uh, the Crown Colony of Lagos uh, in, the early, in the late 19th century and in the early 20th century. Uh, Macaulay, I think, is a fascinating figure, born into a West African elite. His uh, grandfather was Bishop Samuel J. Crowther, who was the first black African uh, Anglican bishop, and his father, Thomas Babington Macaulay, uh, a prominent figure in the Christian Missionary Society uh, and its grammar school, which had been established under his, his headship. And um, his son, Herbert, born in 1864, died in 1946, I think is of particular uh, uh, interest. Having been to his father's CMS school, he ended up working uh, for the colonial um, service in the Crown Colony from 1881, specifically in the public works department as an indexer of Crown grants, the system of dispensing land rights in Lagos, which of course was a contentious issue um, in the colony, partly because of the scarcity of land and as a corollary because of certain uh, ambiguities in the Treaty of Cessation and the rights of the, of the British Crown in claiming um, uh, uh, sovereign rights transferred from the ruling dynasties um, uh, of the Oba and his court. So M Macaulay was involved as one of an elite class of educated but increasingly westernized African civil servants uh, in the land question. Uh, on which, of course, it has its parallel in the British political culture of the same period. Within three years, Macaulay had risen to the position of draftsman and clerk of Crown Grants, and in 1890 was dispatched to the UK to serve as an apprenticeship with the borough engineer of Plymouth, 
G.D. Bellamy. And as one biographer recalls, Macaulay took, quote, a special interest in land engineering and railway surveying. He qualified uh, as a civil engineer in 1893 and in June of that year became a member, possibly, uh, of the Architectural Association in London, um, possibly, therefore, the first black African member of that, of that institution, uh, and then returned to Lagos in that year and became surveyor of crown lands. So Macaulay is kind of typical of the westernizing tendencies of African elites at this time and seems on the face of it the kind of archetypal figure that we think we ought to be in search of. A black African working in the service of the Crown Colony, perhaps you know, one of the first black members of, of the AA or the RIBA. But I think that that kind of does a disservice to the interest that Macaulay holds, in particular under a, a kind of decolonial uh, uh, rubric. What's more significant, I think, is the fact that despite his impeccable Christian missionary credentials, his interest in folkloric and indigenous medicinal ritual, and the fact that not long after his return to Lagos, he became well known as a vociferous agitator against the colonial government's policy, even if he repeatedly asserted loyalty to the British crown. And I think that's significant because uh, of his experience in the system of land tenure and his skills in surveying, uh, engineering, and at least in the rudiments of architectural design and the, and the kind of multidisciplinarity or fluidity of practical skills, I think, is, is worth further reflection. Some of the flashpoints of Macaulay's anti-imperial and proto-Nigerian nationalist agitation, in fact, centered on land tenure and inheritance in which he articulated nuanced anti-colonial positions, arguing consistently for indigenous, albeit elite, rights or custodianship of land for communal purposes. And that came to a head uh, in the Apapa land case between 1915 and 1921, in which some 255 acres of land were contested by the chief Olua Amadou Tijani. The British government argued that the normal system of compensation established under the Treaty of Cessation should prevail. Olu argued that, in fact, much higher compensation was owed uh, on the principle of communal land ownership. And so vehement was Macaulay's personal support for this case that it was eventually taken to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, i.e. the highest court of appeal in the British uh, imperial judiciary. And this defense of indigenous and or traditional systems of inheritance was also leveraged in Macaulay's testimony to something called the Ward Price Commission, which was a, a, a colonial co government commission drawn together to determine the system of dynastic succession in the office of the Oba by the House of Dosemu, a front, in other words, to displace the incumbent Eliko uh, uh, and uh, Ward Price uh, had been a colonial administrator who'd been based... Uh, in southern Nigeria for some time and who'd commissioned, been commissioned to report on land tenure in Yoruba land in the 1930s. And I'm just going to quote, as I draw to a close, from his memoirs uh, of colonial administration, the pithily named Dark Subjects. In most countries of the world, so War Price says, the rules under which land is held by owners or transferred from one ownership to another are common knowledge. But in southern Nigeria, there is still a certain amount of vagueness in the minds of the government and its officers concerning this important matter. It is not clear whether it is permissible for natives to hold land as freehold, or whether foreign Africans may buy land, or whether sales of land between natives will be recognized by the courts. It was the vision of the country... It was the division of the country into strictly administrative units by the British government, which produced, and still produces, a crop of disputes. Land, which formerly no one had troubled to claim suzerainty over, is now the subject of quarrel between two rival chiefs, each desiring to collect tax money from farmers within the disputed area, to swell the revenue of his local administration, and not unwilling to enhance the importance of his position by increasing the area of his jurisdiction. Now that British ideas of land tenure are beginning to seep through to the native mind, the desire of owners to make the most of what they now possess, regardless of the needs of their children, is getting commoner. And this, of course, is precisely the kind of rhetoric one might expect from a colonial administrator. It encapsulates 
the conscious and conspicuous methods of coloniality to skew the social relations between indigenous peoples, land now the subject of quarrel between two rival chiefs and so on, and ideas of inheritance and heritage, decisions made by indigenous landowners, quote, regardless of the needs of their children. And I think that this, you know, I think connects back to um, m my interests uh, in the LSA and my interests as a historian, which is, I think, if we're to take uh, ideas and methods of decolonial praxis seriously uh, in a kind of ambitious and progressive reimagining of how we produce sustainable, uh, uh, ecologically vibrant, built and natural environments, we have to understand in much more depth the complex ways uh, in which architecture and, and the production of the built environment were and continue to be implicated in, in coloniality. And uh, part of what has kind of concerned me in the discussion about decolonizing architecture and decolonizing architectural history in the wake of Roads Must Fall and indeed uh, uh, of the Confederate Monuments controversy in the US is there's a lot of focus on design, uh, even on making, um, and perhaps not enough on uh, these more nefarious and more insidious uh, techniques of coloniality in which architecture was implicated and which figures, uh, I think, like Macaulay, um, sought to uh, occupy sometimes ambiguous but still, I think, interestingly critical positions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, in my estimation, we have about 10 minutes before the end of the session uh, was or the, the session was supposed to end. I'm assuming Warebi is not here yet. Is he? Who does here? Well, who does chairing the next session though? So that's fine. What it does give us time to do though is probably pose a few questions to all of you who've been on the on the um, stage today, which I think really come to issues around land tenure and land rights, which both Kukua and Neil have talked about, but also the challenges in terms of positionality as to where, I guess, African architecture sees itself, which is part of, I guess, the, one of the main themes of, 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 of Afrahun itself. So I think I'm going to take, indeed, my um, convener's chair's action to ask you all um, to, I guess, if there's one thing you feel critical that we really want to explore now in the 21st century, knowing what we know of the past. And I think really considering things like diaspora, climate issues, and indeed what we think in terms of whether it is unformalization or, and indeed the ideas about decolonization, what would be the thing you would most want us to explore um, as we go forward in terms of issues that I guess Afrahun should be thinking about? And he came, unfortunately, to my right, my countryman. Oh, I, I thought you would have it go leftward because, because my, my positions have, have, have been articulated in the past. Um, a couple of things. I mean, it's interesting that Neil mentions uh, the sort of Wembley exhibition. Um, because I don't know if you know this, Neil, but I, I've done a little bit of work um, on the exhibition in relation to pursuing a particular sort of non-professionalized builder and architect who um, ended up as one of the exhibitors at the Wembley exhibition in, in 1924. And I, I think what I find particularly interesting about this figure whose last name is Uzoka, U-Z-O-K-A, is that he ends up touring the UK. I, I haven't quite figured out how that worked, but there was some kind of iterate, it, itineration in the UK. And some of the places he was being encouraged to visit were the new housing project, some of them actually surrounding <laughs> Wembley, which I think he was meant to learn from something about what, what the modern might have meant. Uh, but he does ac actually end up also going all the way up to Scotland and uh, ends up uh, uh, visiting the, uh, the Edinburgh Castle. And what's absolutely fascinating in terms of what 
the modern seems to have been for this particular figure is that that's where he lights up and he burrows a lot from Edinburgh Castle in relation to what he thinks is modern and takes it back to this newly established colonial town called Oka in southern Nigeria and builds a small house for himself, which is a kind of miniature object that is burrowing a lot from a building that for him resonates in relation to his own imagination of what the future might be and completely disinterested in what was sort of the English early, I don't know what you call, sort of garden city architecture, but early modern architecture of the UK. So I think that absolutely, I would agree that there are depths to be plumbed in, in the archive for sure in relation to trying to sort of reconstruct alternative narratives of the modern. So that's one thing, I mean, it's my personal interest certainly, but that's one thing I would sort of want us to do is to sort of begin to think what do we mean when we speak about the modern and the contemporary. And rather interesting in my second point, and I don't know if you remember this, Neil, but we had encountered each other, me and you, in, an, in another context in which at the time you seemed incredibly interested in the question of architecture, like what's this object? Is it necessarily a phenomenon that is recognized across all cultures. You, you, were, you were at the time quite pushing for the idea of something different, something almost sort of non-architectural. I have to say that I'm really fascinated by that question and that idea. And my two slides here, um, the ones that were more landscapey than they were sort of physical buildings in the way we might be much more familiar. Yeah, the two very green slides to the left um, are really sort of my attempts to sort of begin to ask questions about, about the landscape and how the landscape in itself uh, both contains ideas about space and about architecture, in quotes here, that is deployed in all kinds of uh, contexts that become, you know, family structures, even palace structures, and how buildings are organized in those kinds of spaces when they are buildings. But how in many contexts, you sort of search for the idea of a building as a sort of solid object that's meant to live forever, and you are often at a great loss. And yet, the absence of building does not, in these contexts, mean the absence of a kind of organization of space or of the kinds of mental procedures that people who end up building seem to channel themselves through in order actually to begin to imagine how one distributes oneself physically in space. Um, so those two, sort of the modern and the issue of what's architecture anyway, is what I'd be interested in having us explore. Thank you. Kukua? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so I, yeah, I was thinking about it and from the point of view of what I'm currently studying, which sometimes I take these really random detours in pursuits of architectural history, but I promise they, they come back to architecture. Um, I think a thing that we have to rediscover is relations, um, relations to people, but relations to land and space, um, to find the essence of why we did certain things the way we did. Um, by we, I mean Africans. Um, not to return to an imagined past, which frankly I think is ridiculous and, and not going to happen. Um, but yeah, to really find the why. So one thing that I'm currently studying, pursuing architectural histories is relations around death and funerals um, and, and burials. Um, and this is really brought to mind by Prof. Okuye's statement um, on sometimes there's not a physical structure, but a sort of organizational space, which is maybe in stories, is in memories. Um, so this relationship of space, so just an example, relationship to space and land around death, dying, and funerals. Um, Ghanaian funeral culture is intense. It can be beautiful, it can be flashy, celebratory, um, during uh, the pandemic when we're all locked up. I don't know if you saw the coffin dances, that was from Ghana. Um, and it can be very expensive. 
but also cold and kind of cruel to the bereaved. And I went through this, I lost my dad during the pandemic. Um, and that's, in thinking and studying around it, that's because of a loss of relationships and misunderstanding why we do the big funerals, the huge funerals. Um, so just reading like ethnographic tests, historical, anthropological stuff from the time. Um, does this organizational space compounds, home compounds were organized really flexibly and loosely in that Khan culture. And one of the reasons was that when you had things like weddings, like naming ceremonies, like funerals, it was to allow for people to come and set up temporary homes within your home so they could feed you, they could care for you, they could clothe you. But we've lost this, especially in cities with our small gated communities and compounds. So you have the funerals, you still have the demand and expectations for the huge numbers, but you, haven't, you don't have the space where they can come and live and care for you. They can come and live and make sure you eat and cook for you. So what happens, the family has to feed a thousand people. The family has to make sure a thousand people have souvenirs. So we're doing the things without remember the relations that we used to do. And, and this is just one example, but I think there's this loss of relations. And I'm now touching on what Neil was talking about, about this land and Macaulay around land. There's some similar stuff in Ghana at the time as well. Um, and one thing is this privatization of, of land and communal and community owned homes, because land at its core is not owned by individuals in Ghana. Um, in a lot of ethnic groups, especially that can again, um, it's held in trust by the kin and belongs to the community um, and family heads for the whole family. So you can't really buy land. So I think this is what this governor is, is, is just so confused about. You can't buy land. You can be leased land for 49 years, for 99 years, but you have to give it back to the family or to the chief. But through colonization um, and through the kind of economic system, um, Gold Coast at the time, now Ghanaian businessmen, have to have collateral for loans. And how do they get collateral? They have to put up their family home. And how do they put up their family home? They claim it belongs to them. So you have homes, I don't know if anyone knows Elmina, which like in my mind should be like the Liverpool of Ghana, but it's not. There's a lot of rundown, dilapidated things that you can see here from the 1800s, but are rundown dilapidated because you're no longer for the family. Someone said he was, it was his. They put it up for a loan, maybe it got seized by a bank. It just got lost, it just got disconnected from the family roots and no one cares for it anymore because it's not family property. And you see this in Osu, other parts of Accra. And I really think it's a loss of relations and understanding why we used to do the things we do. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm very interested in what the kind of m morphological possibilities of re-engaging with uh, those forms of tenure might be, and thereby what you know, what typologies might emerge. I think that, that uh, is one way of mitigating the risk of lapsing into, you know, just evocations of vernaculars. Um, and I don't see enough of that work coming through, certainly within UK schools um, or, of um, diaspora students. And one of the things that, that certainly I would love to see is, is uh, our students armed with the ability to start producing that kind of serious critical work and advocating for, uh, for change wherever they are. Um, so that's, that's w one objective. Ikem is referring um, to uh, a discussion that we had um, now two or three years ago um, and a panel I, I convened with, with Nick Beach um, uh, for the European Architectural History Network called Decolonizing Architectural History. But the purpose of that was in a sense to, you know, was to challenge um, uh, the idea uh, or the seriousness um, with which anyone was really treating that project. And 
And I think what you're referring to is my ongoing frustration with the fact that um, decolonial praxis, you know, under certain discursive rubrics, uh, is trying to take aim at the roots of uh, Western European epistemology. How can architecture, as a particular Western European epistemic construct, survive unscathed if we're to take that project seriously? And I, get, I, I think my frustration is perhaps our tendency, still trapped within that epistemic game, to translate even this discussion back into architecture, a thing called architecture, a set of familiar praxis, a set of familiar uh, epistemic foundations, which underpin something that we call architecture. Now, of course, that's, I guess, scary. That's a scary place to, to be in, but I think we've got to go there. Uh, and that's partly why, in, across my two slides, in a similar way, I think it came, I, I, I didn't really show any buildings. What I tried to show were, were, were objects, were images that span uh, the ecological uh, uh, empire timber, um, craft, design, yes, and land, and land tenure. And so I think we've got to find richer ways of talking about um, potentially new um, disciplinary constructs or, or, you know, or, or escaping disciplinehood, um, um, perhaps more ambitiously still. Uh, and I'd be very interested in, um, in furthering those discussions, absolutely. So I remain as annoyed as I was two years ago about that. Well, this is a great place to end this session, and I should actually also welcome the fact that this is the place to have the discussion. We've just had um, Demas Wilko get the Golden Horn Award, and he, as some of us will know in architectural circles in Nigeria, was considered not an architect, but I think in terms of what he has brought to uh, architecture in general, or indeed, I would say, creativity in Africa, this is an amazing, he's, been, he's had this amazing life which has at last been acknowledged. So I think we go um, vicariously into the next session. But thank you everybody for listening to this part of the session. And I think we'll have a short um, break before we continue the next panel. Thank you again. And thank you to our eminent speakers, um, Ikem, Kukua, Neil. And uh, please, uh, as part of the second session and maybe at the end of the second session, we absolutely want to also have a conversation with you, the audience, and to have you ask questions that we will attempt to answer or at least write down as something that we need to address in the network in the future. And to continue the conversation. So thank you again for this session. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for that first um, really interesting and uh, I think provocative session on um, a set of kind of urgent and important questions around African architectural and urban history. My name is Huda Tayob, uh, and I'm a South African architect and architectural historian, and I will be moderating the second part of today's session. And in the second part, which is a round table, we hope to expand and expand on and continue some of the key questions that were raised in the first part, both foregrounding and drawing out further urgent questions that are emerging from the field of African architectural and urban history, both on the continent and beyond. The preface to this is, of course, that we are not working in an absent or empty field, as we've already heard, even if architectural history has typically seen the African continent as a site of lack. Perhaps drawing on the South African theorist, Achima Feje, we need to reconsider the discipline, how it functions, and who it attends to, not just for and from the African continent, but for what this might mean for architecture and architectural history more generally. So 
I think, as we've also heard today, you know, the question that we're here to ask is, can we think about the future of African architectural and urban history without questioning its varied pasts? As we know more from anthropological and archaeological studies, the continent has been the site of established global cities and towns and impressive architectures over centuries that have taken different forms, different material conditions, and existed across varied sites in different ways. So there's a question of disciplinarity at play here that I think has already been raised and we should, um, it would be good to speak about a bit more. Uh, and and we've, we've heard this also in relation to thinking about architecture's entanglements with legal systems, bylaws, and property rights, amongst others. At the same time, there's the important question of audiences and access. So the study of these older built sites and environments has precedent in a range of projects that extend from architectural writings, that, it, that also do extend to architectural writings, um, from scholarly texts to manifestos and exhibitions, uh, a range of radica curricula developed at places like Kumasi or the Zaria School to the Festac 77 Arch African Architectural Technology Exhibition, among many others, and, and a range of numerous and uh, varied forms of spatial practices and ways of understanding the built environment, all of which continue and continue to ask us to consider the ongoing relevance of this kind of work. That these concerns are not new does not take away from their ongoing urgency and relevance. With the growing urbanization, development of megacities, uh, increasingly development of megacities, and the increasing pres pressing calls to decolonize and decarbonize um, with the climate catastrophes that are being faced. So in picking up on these deep and recent histories, this second panel invites in scholars to share some of their work ranging from questions around the epistemological and methodological issues which need to be addressed, to ask what are the possible approaches, methods, starting points, and challenges to researching on and from the continent? And how do we begin to develop theoretical frameworks from located sites and places, both for the continent and beyond? Um, we're also going to, um, I think it's also important to think about the potential of transnational considerations and collaborations, the institutions institutional and infrastructural necessities that make certain kinds of work possible, and the importance of public engagement. As well as what is at stake in tracing global environmental histories or following sites of extraction or material histories, specifically in relation to thinking about the materia materiality of architecture and taking decarbonizing more seriously. Um, and then I think there is a kind of bigger set of questions around who are our publics, um, where are our publics, and what do these provocations suggest for architectural and urban history education. So I'm going to start with Ikem, who we've already, Ikem Okoye, Associate Professor of Art and Architecture at the University of Delaware, um, who you've already heard from. And I would like to ask you, Ikem, to share uh, some of your insights on questions around what is the where do we find, where, how do we theorize um, from the continent? So you've previously written on a survey of African architectural history that, and I'm quoting, architectural historians, whether African, American, or European, are used to the moniker African standing in for something essential, something traditional or indigenous, a locally invented product uncontaminated by more globalized histories. And you've elsewhere also asked, where do we find modernism? You seem to be asking us to move from the urgency usually associated with the kinds of developmentalist discourses uh, prevalent when speaking about the continent to the urgent epistemic framings and methods that we should be considering. And I wondered if you could speak a bit more about this um, and thinking specifically in light of the Haitian historian Ralph Michel Triot, what is at stake when we think not only about not not to ask what is African architectural urban history, but to ask how it works or how it might work in different ways. Oh, thank, thank you very much for that question, um, Huda. And I have to preface this by saying that um, I wasn't 
actually expecting me to be part of the panel, so I'm having to think on my feet here, but no doubt I will be able to. Um, so maybe I'll start with a little bit of an anecdote, which is that um, there's a particular kind of contemporary architecture that one encounters again and again in urban, certainly West African spaces, um, perhaps in the last eight to 10 years. And it's very well exemplified, I think, by some of the framing that uh, might be familiar to, to some of us in the work of uh, Tosin Oshinawo, the Lagosian uh, uh, woman and architect who is currently um, directing the, going to be, well, directing the upcoming uh, Sharjah uh, Biennale, if one may talk about other Biennales in the context of Venice. Uh, but I had often wondered where some of her vocabulary emerges from. I mean, she's, she's a pretty skilled architect, but in many West African contexts, builders can erect buildings and you don't really need uh, architectural registration qualifications in order to get around certain rules in order for, uh, for anyone to actually build. So there's a sort of language, if I use fenestration as an example, that you find repeatedly, but that is well located within this particular architect's work. I had no idea why it suddenly, be, and I wish I had slides, but I don't, but I had no idea where it might have come from and why it's propagated so successfully. It's a kind of new way of producing architectural facades that one can sort of see its advance. And then I come to Venice, and I'm sort of looking around, and I see that there's a tradition in Venice, in some of these old buildings, of framing a window with, I don't know, three-inch, very sort of simple, almost modernist frames, in a sense, although they date back to the Renaissance or sometime after that. And I'm struck by that fact. And what's really interesting about, about this, and this is where it would be connected to the question of epistemology, is that I had been working and continue to work on the question of, of modernism in Africa, and have had ex an experience in the southern Niger Delta area of encountering buildings, some of them produced in the 1920s, that when I initially started a project of basically oral history, because they're, they're not things recorded in the archives if one is going to sort of reconstruct the narrative. And initially, I would get responses for another set of buildings that suggested they were produced in the 1950s, right? So the initial responses I was getting, just asking people, when was this built and can you tell me the story, was that they were produced in the 1950s. As I dug deeper, um, you know, a much more extended research project, uh, some of it engaging the archives as well, I was sort of shocked to realize that in the historical memory of a place in which some of these are quite substantial buildings were located, they think of it as a basically 1950s, almost uh, uh, post-colonial building, right? That, they were, that the imagination of a possibility of certain kinds of architectural skills, certain imaginations of the future had been erased in the colonial era and in the immediate post-colonial era so that in these communities there was no memory that in the 1920s they were doing certain kinds of work. And this is all to say that for me architectural history therefore actually has a, a critical um, bearing on um, not, not, not just how a community or a people actually understand themselves in the world, 
actually understand the kind of place and the kind of achievements that had occurred within their own societies. Uh, but also, as you can imagine, allows architects in the present, if they begin to understand their own histories and their own traditions of building and its expansive, if you like, borrowing from cultures globally, that it enables a kind of imagination of their futures, which might be quite different from some sense that a particular kind of towing and going with fashions in the West is what brings success. Um, and I remember that in particular, uh, the, the buildings of the 1920s I'm describing, uh, you know, as I've researched it more and more, it becomes absolutely amazing to realize, and this is why I'm choosing this as an example, because we are in Venice, that it was produced, or they were produced at a moment when the British colonial state was imposing a certain kind of modernity, call it sort of colonial modernity if you like, on the landscapes as a, not just as a representation of their own imperial ideas about what the modern should be in this context, but as a means of sort of marking their power and control on the landscape. And these buildings are, not looking at what the British are doing, even though this is in a colonial regime, and they're sort of looking elsewhere in their own universe, meaning other West African places, but rather surprisingly also beyond. Because what I finally came to realize of a building, remember, built in 1924, imagine, because I'm fortunate enough to have discovered that there were also drawings made in the local community for these buildings that they were imagined in the, about 1921. And the shock is to trace the possible connections and to come to a realization that actually it's the railway station building in Turin, in Italy, that is a source for a local, non-scale, I mean, you look at the drawing and you know that this is not someone who's been to architecture school, that he's had some opportunity, perhaps through images and photographs, to understand other kinds of architecture outside what the British state mandates or controlled in order to build something new and to build something new that moreover challenges a certain idea that the sort of colonial state had. Um, in an extended talk, I actually begin to explore what colonial building officials, we are thinking of these kinds of people, right? Because the colonial state, we tend to sort of imagine that there's a kind of um, um, financial power that they have to sort of fund the colonial, the colonial project itself, but what one then finds is that they were operatives who were looking at these Africans in a colonial situation and sort of envious and actually, in, with a certain amount of incredulity, could not understand why they lived in the kinds of places they did, and these Africans, who after all were supposed to be colonial subjects, and not kings or queens or anybody um, like that, could, under their noses, produce certain kinds of buildings. So for me, something about the recuperation or the recovery of a certain understanding of how Africans actually imagine the future and to go back as far as possible backwards to reconstruct the nature of that imagination, I believe gives a certain kind of power uh, in the present, in the sort of dialogues with you know, the Western academies, with the producers of Biennales, that there's absolutely um, no question but that we have a right to be very much part of, very much present in, um, in things like, you know, global exhibitions, which Biennales, after all, are all about, right? So, so that architectural history itself um, can, by nature, 
work against a certain erasure of memory, a certain kind of amnesia that, after all, is why maybe until this particular exhibition, it's been possible to simply ignore Africa, basically, and to do so not just in the context of, of a space like an exhibition setting, but also in the literatures and in the textbooks that teach about the history of architecture, that basically, even in the present, uh, very rarely have any comment to make about what Africans had to contribute to the history of architecture, right? Um, and I leave aside intentionally my response to the other issue, which is a sort of decolonial one about um, the nature of architecture as a phenomenon anyway, although it's something I explore elsewhere. Uh, thank you, Ikim. I think it's um, you've raised a few kind of interesting questions that uh, I hope we'll come back to. And, but I think picking up on two issues, so one around this question of these kinds of um, entanglements or movements of following materials or following uh, architecture in a way, and then uh, across borders. And then I think also this question of lack or the absence of African architecture. So I want to turn to Murray. And Murray Fraser is a professor of architecture and global culture at um, UCL, at the Bartlett School of Architecture in London. And I think, Murray, I wanted to ask you, I know you've recently been working with the new Bannister Fletcher's Global History of Architecture. And, and in your work more generally, there's an attention to post-colonial and transnational histories. I wanted to ask if you, and Bannister Fletcher's, of course, one of these volumes that historically has not only relegated Africa to a minor role, but actually is completely absent. And so I wanted to ask if you can speak to some of the key challenges that you've encountered, um, but also where is the potential to challenge the existing canon when we start to think of these absences more directly? Um, and then also maybe to speak a bit about the potential of transnational relationships and collaborative projects, bearing in mind the kinds of inequalities that we deal with specifically across north-south um, divides, which I think are important to bring into these conversations, whether knowledge-based or infrastructure, visas, funding sources, um, these sorts of things. Does that work? I think it's working. Hello? Can, is this working? Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you, Huda. Um, I should start just by pointing out I am an anomaly on the, on the panel session today in that while I'm an a historian of architecture and urbanism, I'm not a historian of African architecture and urbanism or African diasporic, African uh, hi history or urbanism. And I, um, but I am, uh, as Huda mentioned, I was asked a few years ago to edit the 21st edition of the Sir Bannister Fletcher's History of Architecture, which we renamed the Global History of Architecture, one of these kind of monumental late Victorian tomes about putting the world's architecture in some kind of relationship with each other. Um, we tried to re totally rethink it. We, we, we basically tore everything up and tried to think about how we might do it now, um, and we realized we have not cracked it. This is a, 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 a near impossible challenge, but it's also one that seemed to us to be worthwhile doing. And from that, there were probably two things, I think, particularly that might be relevant to, to today, is that firstly, we wanted to basically ask a, a, a wide range of experts from around the world, from different cultures, different backgrounds, different ethnicities, to write the material, rather than it being a small team picking up on other scholars' work and reproducing it. We wanted people who were actually working in all these areas around the world. And one of the things that came up very, very clearly, and maybe no surprise, was that if you're trying to do this, this, this thing we generally call architecture, we generally use this universal world architecture, but if you even take what we call architecture and look at the amount of research and work that's done on architecture, in places around the world, it is shockingly unequal. It, it really is quite astonishing the amount, the difference in level of kind of investigations there have been in, broadly speaking, Western or European, North American contexts and the rest of the world. And the fact that this is still the case today in 2023 is, is really quite shocking and embarrassing. And we're all 
I guess, a lot of us collectively to blame for this as well. So there's, so there's a real issue there, really. And, and I think in some ways, this idea that we need to develop, you know, that range of thinking, innovative thinking in places where it has not really been carried out extensively before. So that was one thought <laughs> there as well. So we, we really have to think about how we can do something about this as well. The second thing really is about the kind of, you know, how you make this change happen. You know, how, how would this uh, change come about? And quite often, if you're doing a book like this, I think one of the tendencies are, you tend to think that this is trying to be uh, some kind of um, canonical fixed account, some kind of uh, sort of universalizing imperial account of the world's architecture. And of course, the more we try to deal with this, and we dealt with 88 authors from around the world, so we're dealing with a very large group of people, the, the more impossible you realize that this task is. And so really what we came to think about is it, it is a, a provisional snapshot of how we might try to understand transnational flows in architecture at this moment in time. Uh, so it's not the end game by any means at all, and, it, and the, they will change, and the whole project really is there to be con constantly rethought and redone. And then and during that as well, I was also struck with the fact that I think there's, a, in terms of when it comes to African architecture and uh, history and urbanism scholarship, there is a, a generational change taking on now. I think there's a kind of a huge growth, so we're seeing really, really intelligent, talented, ambitious, younger scholars, like this has not been before. And I think that that, that is the, to me, the, the kind of the, the way in which we will transform this is by giving voice and giving opportunities to a, a lot of people who really have effectively been excluded uh, from commenting on what is called architecture and or architectural history up till now. And so that's basically the challenge that we've, we've got to deal with. Um, I, I know that quite a few of the critics of our version of the Bannister Fletcher said, you know, there's nothing you can do about this. You know, these books will always be Western-centric. They'll always be imperialistic, etc." I must admit, I don't have that, that same view. Um, I realize that we still have elements of that today. We're still these very deeply embedded imperial structures, as we've been hearing about as well. But I think the thing ca it can be rewritten. I think as, you know, as, as, as scholarship gets distrib distributed around the world, that it will become rewritten, that it can be challenged, et cetera. And so I, I, I've, I've, so I've cautious but a more optimistic kind of view about this. And I think it's going to be the next generation of younger scholars and other researchers working in this field that will change uh, what we think about architecture, et cetera, and also help to remedy these kind of really huge gaps in, 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 in inequality uh, in terms of scholarship and research around the world. To do so, um, and then this is, I'm now really interested in what other people think about this as well. It struck me also doing this book, it's almost like a, a mad project with 88 authors, you know, it's a really sort of difficult project. But I think one of the answers is to actually engage more in collective scholarship. I think, I think we have a model within architectural history uh, and, and architectural journey that talk, talks about the, the lone genius. So we talk about the lone genius architect, but we do also have the lone genius writer, researcher, author, and I think we have to slightly move away from that, that, that model. I, th I think, you know, if you look at other disciplines so that are really making ground waves by having large collective projects, and I think we should have more large collective projects, which then goes on to <laughs> who does next point is about how you get there. Um, and that's one of the things that we, obviously we will talk more about. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to answer questions about how we get there, etc. But I think to me, there is a very sort of crude imbalance at the moment between the wealth that has been amassed in the wealth and the, the relative lack of wealth elsewhere in the world. And I think it's the duty of universities, institutions, which have the wealth, is to somehow find ways to redistribute that um, through, through the scholarship. And I think that's an, a, another major task. And I, th I can see that one of the tasks for Afrin will be to try and find some ways of making that imbalance uh, fairer uh, to some degree. Thanks, Murray. I think the, those are important things that we need to think about. Um, and I think maybe in part of, in, in what you've said, uh, the question of audiences is also important. So I think there's a kind of, there's often an assumption in scholarly work of a kind of global north audience. And maybe conversations like this also not need to start to think about who are our audiences and how do we start to shift um, the expectations or, um, the kinds of intentions. Um, and I think with that, I would like to ask um, 
uh, Ola Oduku to share some of her experiences. So professor and head of School of Architecture at the University of Liverpool. Uh, I mean, Ola, your work is expansive and has been grounded in various parts of the continent with many local partners. And this has extended from collaborative research projects to writing workshops and more recently developing public exhibitions. There seems to be a clear provocation for the importance of public engagements for how, um, and I think this raises a question of how architectural knowledge circulates more generally. And, and I think from my own experience of teaching in Johannesburg and Cape Town, one of the key issues, even in a place like South Africa, is for students to be able to access things from other parts of the continent, so um, beyond kind of the global sphere. So I was wondering if you can speak a bit more to this, to your work, to these questions around current and possible future audiences. Um, who, who should we be speaking to and why is it important? And what does this kind of public work potentially do? Thank you. Well, it's a tall order. But I think, I mean, maybe anecdotally, we're talking, actually Eva, who's in the audience, was saying, when she was thinking about what to do in life, she was told, well, you can't be an architect, there are too many of them. I think this issue about what architecture is, is something critical and how publics engage with it is even more important. And for this, I'm going back to the earlier session about the fact that architecture is at the intersection of other things like anthropology, sociology, and so on and so forth. And I would say that part of the issue is that the audience for architecture at the moment remains actually quite westernized and rarefied, even in Africa itself. And I think my starting point has always been almost, the, again, one of the African proverbs. You don't know who you are unless you know where you came from. So the link between architecture and the histories and the ways in which local communities understand themselves is critical, and that's something that I think has been challenged and broken for various reasons through prior to imperialism, through the missionary projects, and so on and so forth. So when I think about how we want to engage with architecture, I think it's at that local level, as local as we can make it. Um, so again, some of the work I did a long time ago now with um, Kumasi had us talking to um, senior primary school students about the architecture around them, which they hadn't realized was part of this tropical historical school. But to the hook for them, I think, was the fact that they hadn't realized that it was a Ghanaian architect who'd worked with an Eastern European architect to design one of the major halls in Kumasi itself. And by having that link, that discussion with um, children at primary school level, I think began to raise the ideas about what architecture is, who architects are, and what architecture can be. So there's a need to take architecture, I guess, out of the academy and into the public, which I guess now is quite uh, trendy. But I think, um, again, given that the Global South is always slightly behind oftentimes what's going on elsewhere is not something that is the case. So as has been said, um, anyone can build a building in a lot of parts of Africa, you don't have to be a registered architect. So a lot of these, if you like, other skills that architecture, architects bring to the table are not necessarily explored as much as they could be, and people don't necessarily appreciate the architecture. And the other thing, again, is that I think, yeah, there are instances where African culture and so on, if you like, raises its head. I'm old enough to remember 2000 when the late great Okwi Onwaza was involved in some of those major exhibitions where there was that um, engagement with architecture, but it was always a temporary thing for a short period of time. And I think part of that, again, is that we don't have enough, um, I would say, scholarship, again, from within arch um, Africa itself. And there's nothing wrong with um, students in Africa. Oftentimes, the cases they're not necessarily as exposed as we would want them to be to architectural writing, conventions, and so on, which take place elsewhere, which is why we have this asymmetric relationship between the West, if you like, and the rest. And one of the things, again, which is important in terms of how we therefore, what would I say, project, display architecture, is that 
it does again come out of the academy and through things like exhibitions and engagement, it's something that uh, is more available to everybody. Again, anecdotally, Festac 77, to show you how old I was, I am, was in my teens, and a lot of Nigerians of my generation can remember that being a major event. So one should never underestimate the, the, the ways in which an exhibition can communicate across parts of um, uh, countries and nations, so the Empire Exhibition and so on. And it's what is ex displayed at these exhibitions that makes an impression. But for African and I would say other parts of the global south, I think the key thing is again, the knowledge that is again pr printed and promoted is often still coming from the global north. So until we have voices that actually are able to both contribute to collaboratively and critically challenge some of the, the um, information that comes out about Africa, African architecture, urbanization, we're not going to be we, well, we won't be equal members at the table, but importantly also the voices, indeed the voices of the conqueror, so to speak, are the voices that um, rule the day. So I think a lot of, I guess, the project is to have both the exhibitions, but importantly as well, engage with the younger generation to give them that space and place to be able to say their um, truths and information about um, countries that they're often much more, well, are clearly more embedded than having research going out to, or researchers going out to Africa to research. I think very much that, that model is extractive, if not colonial, and what we need to be looking at is much more in terms of collaboration. So um, part of what I'm really, um, I guess, um, very dedicated to is writing workshops where we get, um, indigenous students at different levels from undergraduate level right up to postgrads to be able to write and so become part of that discussion but then also write in their own original ways so we don't have to follow necessarily the the standard that's going to give you your four star publication using the um, um, British system but it's got to be um, writing that does have validity and does have evidence behind it, whatever that might be. So that's a very important part. But also the ideas about collaboration. So one of the things I'm working on at the moment in Liverpool is our working on the Unilever archive, which for those of you from West Africa, Omo, all the soap and so on, it's the Lever Brothers archive that has now become part of Unilever, which was associated with the Univer United Africa Company, but essentially the constellation of companies that dealt with mercantile life in West Africa. Most of the archival material resides in an archive on Merseyside, actually at Port Sunlight. And at the moment, the main interlocutors, unsurprisingly, are Western researchers. So my theory is that, well, that's fine, but what you're gonna get indeed is a Western lens of all this information, right down to land rights and so on. You need people from Ghana, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, the Congo, uh, to tell us exactly what their viewpoint was of what was going on at the time. It might be Kukua's great-grandfather, it might be Neil's grandfather, that was involved in this. But until we can do the collaborative project, which is exactly what um, Maria has just said, we're not going to get, actually, I think a proper understanding of history. It's always going to be one-sided. So it's, it's good for everybody. And uh, a conference I helped co-host last year pointed out as um, lit literature, um, critical literature theory will tell you, is, you know, we are here because you were there. So it's a shared history. And until we can understand what a shared history is, we're not going to get, if you like, a kind of non-biased version of history. But importantly for me, as a subject of the global south, living in the Western diaspora, these are the stories that I think the generation following us want to hear anyway. <laughs> so in a way, we're hopefully moving into an open door in terms of what we want to do. But I think particularly for a profession and indeed the subjects around history and so on in architecture, it's important that we do um, occupy that space because I think for too long 
it has been very, very asymmetric. And the reasoning around that is whether we have access to archives and even things like today. Okay, force majeure. But the reality is that to travel to the West for a lot of um, students from the South is still very difficult. It's political, it's economic, it's so many other things. So it's important that we use um, what we can, which is things like exhibitions and indeed these um, areas where we can have collaboration to begin to collaborate more successfully and to make things, I think, at least try to make the table wider and a bit more even. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ola. Uh, I think that's a kind of uh, good um, a segue into, uh, I wanted to ask Akukwa, you mentioned earlier the Accra Archives as a project, and I think the, the kind of image you showed of um, the archives before digitization is an image that's very familiar to us and is also part of, I think, some of the kinds of issues that um, Ola has just mentioned. Denise Pereira da Silva has argued that a radical program needs to address simultaneously the juridic, the economic, and the symbolic. And I think in many ways, following the project from a distance, Accra Archives is a kind of institution building in some senses. So I wondered if you can speak a bit more about some of the challenges or kind of how you understand this as, as a bigger project. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for that. Um, so yeah, it, it did definitely start off, I thought, it, I thought of it as, in the beginning, as an institution building project. And I do see um, it eventually uh, being this archive, maybe physical as well, of not only these digitized drawings and images that people have shared, but also artifacts where we can find them as well. Um, but as I was doing this project and collaborating and speaking to people, um, people on the ground who, who know of these buildings, have lived with them, have lived these histories. Um, another element that came to it as also became a kind of, um, I don't have a good term for it, but maybe institution strengthening or sharing. Um, so finding pockets where I could support and plug into and help people start their own kind of projects, because they don't all have to be part of this Accra Archive project. So um, just an example, um, so I would do workshops on how you could kind of start your own digitizing project um, with, um, I don't think I can say the name of the app because it would be an ad, but there's an app you can have on your phone. It's like, there's a free plan and you can upgrade. Um, digitizing your own family's histories, recording, oral histories from your grandparents and things like that. And, and this I would mostly have with um, uh, students, university, secondary school, and things like that. Um, and through this project as well, we worked with um, the, the, the owners of the building permits are the Accra Metropolitan Assembly. Um, and we had staff from there working on the project with us um, who were like, oh, so like, I've been passing by this room. Um, I knew these things were probably going to get destroyed at the time. Like, I, I didn't know what it is. Um, so part of the project, so before I, I ever wrote anything, tried to do anything, like write an academic article based on it before starting this project, um, everything that was written on it was by people who worked on the projects. And for many of them, it was their first time writing any kind of academic article. But I thought this was important, like going to what Ola was saying, like people who, who this is really close to, like who have lived these histories or have people that have lived these histories trying to analyze and write what's important to them. And very few of them had anything to do with architecture, right? So there was an article on naming practices among the Ghans, which is the main ethnic group in Ghana that someone wrote. Someone wrote about the people who lived in one particular neighborhood, they traced them. So this is what I mean by maybe institutions sharing or strengthening because then people can do things in their own kind of little spaces, or the more established organizations like the AMA now have a group of people dedicated to preserving um, documents so that in another 100 years, there's not another Kukwa who goes to find a room <laughs> full of these documents. Um, and for the challenges, um, I won't go into the logistical, there are a lot of logistical challenges. Um, 
And I think the funniest, weirdest, biggest was um, you show up with a, like with a project that's funded by the British Library and people are like, aha, so now you have to give this person this amount, this amount, this amount, this amount. I have to explain that I, even I'm not getting paid. Like, would I not pay myself first? Um, so that was this kind of thing. It was difficult, but everywhere I went, like, I would find people who got it, who wanted to be part of it, and who would support it. Um, and we got, we had to really fight to get them not to destroy the material, because to them it was like, and I saw a fire hazard, and so many other things, but we had to make a case for it to be important, um, as important. But that said, I'll say that myself as a historian, which might be kind of, yeah, terrible of me to say, is that I'm not completely sold or convinced that we must preserve everything. I'm sorry, don't be mad at me. Um, but people have really painful relationships to some of these buildings and some of this material. Um, so again, another example of a building that I was really interested in following and um, through the archive, people who knew of it associated it with, um, with the colonial government stealing their land, and then the first independent government under Nkrumah also continue, not giving it back, and subsequent governments not giving it back. So this building was targeted for demolition as part of like a redevelopment thing. And I'm like, oh, but it's going to get redeveloped. Do you not want to preserve it? And they're like, no, it can't go, right? And the historian is like, no, we need to preserve So this is the Fry and Drew Community Center. So for me, I'm like, I, my instinct is let's preserve, let's preserve, let's preserve. But then there's people that live and kind of own these things that do not want it, got to remind of certain things. So I'm not, set, I'm not like, I haven't decided where I stand, whether I destroy it all <laughs> or preserve it all, but I do think it's important to listen to how the people that these things are, are most connected to these things also feel about it, and it might be that they don't want them there. And that's also history. Thank you. I think is this okay? Thank you. Uh, I think that's a really, um, I think, important point to make around these difficult pasts and complex histories. So my final question is for you, Neil, um, that I think picks up on this, on these stories that aren't always easy to tell, but are in many ways about complicity. Um, and in your presentation earlier, I think speaking specifically about the Wembley exhibition, uh, it was really interesting to hear you speak about uh, some of these panels. There's a quote from Toni Morrison where she writes, I, and I'm quoting, I know I can't change the future, but I can change the past. It is the past, not the future, which is infinite. Our past was appropriated, and I'm one of the people who has to reappropriate it. And I was thinking a lot about this kind of question about when you were speaking earlier around telling alternative stories and in a way writing a very different kind of history. Um, and I wondered if you can speak a bit more about that, bringing in this question of disciplinarity, which has kind of been circulating um, and maybe, if relevant, also in relation to education, which I think is always the kind of tricky question. Of what does it mean to be uh, training architects in this kind of open field? Um, I'll come back to the the training and education question, and I might ask you to reiterate it, Huda, in, in due course. Um, I think that exhibitions are, um, you know, complex entities and quite elusive um, to capture. Uh, as any type of historian. Wembley, I think, in particular because it is obviously overshadowed by a much bigger international um, exhibition in 1925 uh, across the Channel in Paris, which had, um, or, you know, or, or which has accrued certain legends to it in terms of uh, an international language of style, namely um, Art Deco, the invented phrase Art Deco. Uh, whereas Wembley was considered 
for a long time, I think, as symptomatic of a, a kind of parochialism um, in, in English visual and material and indeed architectural culture. Um, so I think it, 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 it warrants a multi and cross-disciplinary approach um, in order to capture it. Perhaps paradoxically, I have found, however, using the tools of architecture and kind of um, spatial analysis very useful in trying to really understand, get to grips with what it is. That's probably as much about my own um, disciplinary training. What we're trying to do, what I'm trying to do with the centenary is, as you suggest, then kind of blur lots of boundaries um, and try to escape um, disciplinary strictures. I, I don't know how that will work out. Um, that's part of kind of what, I, what, what I'm curious um, to test. And that's why I'm not just interested in, in kind of what historians in other parts of the world have to say about Wembley, as interesting as that will be, but also these other kinds of, uh, other kinds of traces, other kinds of narratives. Um, but again, I, you know, that's sort of to look forward to, um, rather than for me to reflect on at this stage. Is that, is that responding to your provocation directly enough? Yeah. Um, in terms of the education and training of architects, you know, I think th the opportunity that it seems to me Afrohun may have is architectural education, again, speaking from a UK perspective, speaking from my particular perspective, running a school which was supposed to be disruptive. Um, is that it's still um, pretty old-fashioned, uh, uh, largely unreformed since the since the 50s, um, uh, and can't, I think, potentially really address the arguably imminent ecological collapse and climate emergency that's coming our way very rapidly. And I think that, again, that is partly an epistemic challenge, uh, not just within the field of architecture, but you know, that's about economics, that's about culture, it's about ecology, it's about everything. Um, I, you know, I think it would be a powerful thing if Afrohun could, could start to test, as I say, what, what new disciplinary formations or... or, or, or um, or what the kind of post-disciplinary praxis might look like, um, or may have looked like, I suppose, if we're thinking um, historically, though of course um, professionalization of history is also implicated in, in, um, in, in coloniality, um, is sort of where is sort of the, the, the ground that we could be that we could be staking here. Um, I think the the other thing is. You know, I'm interested in the phenomenon of professionalization and of architectural professionalization uh, and the ways in which um, essentially kind of um, liberal institutions in the 19th century and early 20th century sought to define a common objective of professionalization and of registration through legislation through the um, uh, um, International Congress of Architects. Um, a lot of the legacy of that is in the ways in which I think, you know, it seems to me professionals and educators organize themselves in those other um, post-colonial settings. And I think we could come up again with a more ambitious uh, set of validating criteria, set of curricula um, that can really power the, the education of the next generation of architects. Thank you. Um, so I've actually been told that we have to close. <laughs> There's a hard finish at 4.30. So I think that's an excellent um, point to end on, though, I think, in thinking about the future generation and how we 
perhaps really need to rethink some of these liberal structures that we take for granted and that really kind of reproduce some of the problems we're seeing. Thank you so much to all of you for sharing your, I think, important and provocative insights and hopefully there's time for informal questions after. It's, thanks.